Good. I'm all set. All right, let me know whenever you're ready. I'm ready. Okay. Well, this is the um, Occult Watcher or OW main screen. And uh, Occult Watcher is a .NET enabled worldwide program for sharing information about who plans to observe a given occultation. And it's also a way for the folks who do the calculations of where the shadows will pass to uh, publish that information to the rest of us so we can make informed decisions about whether we want to get out and uh, take a chance that we'll be somewhere underneath the shadow. There's a lot of information on the screen, so um, let me <coughs> describe it for you. Uh, the obvious uh, beginning here is uh, the, the fact that it says Starfield Observatory at the top. Um, what I've done in the configuration, uh, can you see the pop-up window that just came up? Not yet. There it is. Yeah. Yes, I see it now. Okay. So in here, um, you have this uh, option called Sites. And if you travel or you have multiple observatories or you have an observatory at home and you also plan to, to do some mobile recording, you can create saved sites in here where the latitude and longitude are identified and saved. So you don't have to type them in every time. And when you select a site, then it goes, uh, OW goes through and recalculates whether you'll be able to see those based upon the filter criteria that uh, uh, is, in, is specified in another area here. Okay. So at the moment I'm selected for Starfield Observatory and the event filters that I selected I said uh, don't show me events for which and here's the set of filters. If it's more than 65 miles away and so on. Tell me about those. I've gone and I've, I've done some modifications of these and that kind of unsure of what the optimum or what the preferred settings are. Are there recommended settings that you use? Um, well, the first one is basically how far would you like to drive? Um, if the, what the, the one sigma zone is considered to be the area of um, one standard deviation uncertainty around the center line. Uh, and those are identified uh, if you, for each event, a little graph is created along the bottom here, and that's what these uh, blue and pink areas are. Yep, I've been, 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 been playing with it, so I'm familiar with what it looks like. But oh. for Starfield Observatory being a fixed location, mm. uh, what would you recommend for setting on this? Would it be well, it, yeah, that's true. There's no traveling for a fixed location. So right. if you're going to use that, I, I might... Uh, 20 miles outside of the center line or something like that? Just to uh, sure yeah, you can, you, can, you can say, yeah, you can say, t right, 20 miles away from the center line. However, there might be uh, an asteroid which is 60 miles across. Okay, so the bigger, probably kind of bigger shadow, so you want something like that, right? Yeah, so I, that's a good question. For a fixed observatory, I'm not sure what's recommended for that. I'll ask online and see what they say. Because okay. uh, I don't have one, so I'm used to using this uh, in remote mode basically. 12 mag the, the magnitude, of course, is going to depend upon how large your scope is and how dark your skies are. And uh, 10 degrees is an arbitrary number. You know, if it's down in the murk, you might not want to bother to be informed about it because you wouldn't be able to see it anyway. Right. And I, I kind of put mine up to it goes around 20 or 30. Yeah, or 30. Okay, so... Uh, the other options, the one that I have deselected is play sound. The sound that OW plays is really loud and pretty annoying, and it's scary, and I didn't know where it was coming from. But every time they update these events, I got this really loud noise, so I turned that off finally. But I do let it pop up to tell me that something has changed in the information about the, tr the rank or the location or the star magnitude or the asteroid, uh, depending on And then you already have done some exploration of the prediction feeds. Uh, the main one is this iota higher probability events. Planned observations would be everybody who has uh, 
selected an observation and said, I'm going to participate. And then this North America low probability events just gives us the opportunity to try some that aren't necessarily likely, but which will happen uh, occasionally. Yeah, that's the one that I had to load up, but didn't have that one this year. Right. And Steve Preston here is the fellow who does most of these calculations for the uh, asteroids. So um, this is the main listing, and if you've played with it, you know that when you select one of these, uh, let's let's select um, Eurydice, which is, I guess, this guy here. That's the one we're going to play with on the 20th. Um, you get these four selections at the bottom. And the one that I start with here is Show Online Map with Stations. Basically, this shows you the center line. The green line would be the center line through of the asteroid's shadow as best predicted. The blue lines represent the diameter of the asteroid. So if it passed right over dead center on the green line, these would be the northern and southern limits of its shadow. But no prediction is totally accurate. So that's best, 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 best guess. That's best that's the best guess. But these lines represent the uncertainty numbers represented by the pink area here and the pink lines out here. So this first line is the one sigma, which says 66% uh, of the time the shadow will fall between these two lines. And this is the two sigma, which is what, 95% of the time the shadow will fall between these two lines. So the farther apart these are, the less certain this prediction is. The closer those lines are, to the blue lines, the more certain the prediction is, and the more likely that you are to see an actual occultation if you go out somewhere between the two blue lines. Let's try to find one with a, with a higher probability. Um, well, here's Eunomia, the rank 100, and I'll explain what rank is in a moment. So here you can see that the, it's quite a large asteroid. Uh, the shadow goes all the way from Callus down to Portland. And the uncertainty is extremely small. It's very close to the actual size of the asteroid. So we apparently know the, uh, we, we know not only the position of the asteroid, the, the asteroid's orbit, orbital parameters extremely well, but we also appear to know the location of the star with very little uncertainty. Because the uncertainty value for any one of these passes is the product of the uncertainties of the star location and the orbit of the asteroid. So if either one is big, it gets big. And if they're both big, it gets big really fast. That's when these red lines move way out. So in this case, if you went anywhere in here between the blue lines, you would be almost certain to observe an occultation of this asteroid, of this star, by this asteroid. If you were pointed at the right star, which is another challenge we'll talk about. <laughs> and one person has already registered an intent to um, observe this asteroid. That's uh, this MPN person at home. And that is this gray line here. This gray line represents that person's uh, position on the asteroid's cross-section. Now, where are they? I have no idea. But if we zoom out, they could be in the United States or Canada, or they could be in Europe. It depends on the daylight. Oh, here they are. So here, here's the guy. So this, this giant telescope represents the, where, we, where our station would be if we said we're going to observe. And you can put that anywhere. This small... Each of the small telescopes represents a person who's already put up a public commitment saying, I'm going to try to observe this. So this guy is in Saskatchewan, uh, Cal in Alberta, out in cowboy country. And, you know, if you wanted to know... So the idea would be, if we wanted to observe this, and, and many people were trying to observe it, we might want to uh, place... And you can place your, your uh, if you wanted to go mobile for this one, you could, you could say, okay, I'm going to drive up to Waterville. And you can right-click here 
and that would move the little the, the, the location of your of your intended observing point is the bottom dot at the bottom of the fork of this telescope so that little point down there and that says okay I I would uh, you know if you if you do that and then click on enter station info down here on the right and type in basically some identifier for your name and, and the fact that you're mobile um, a gray line would appear down here and that would tell people that you've got a few kilometers south of the line and Mr. Noble's got a few kilometers north so anybody else who wanted to jump on should probably pick one of these MJ areas up around here so we don't sit on each other's line and waste uh, the effort okay so um, let's go back to Eurydice here so um, we've got our details on the web and I've registered us here by uh, entering, creating a site for Starfield Observatory, and then without moving this, just clicking on Enter Station Info, and uh, there we are, right there, Oval ASNNE. So we're at number four. Uh, there's one person who's just identified themselves as home, which is not particularly useful. Bruce Berger, at home. You met Bruce. Yeah, he's down in Maryland, right? Uh, nope, he's in um, oh. <laughs> he's in Massachusetts just uh, over by Chelmsford. Skaggsville, Maryland is number three, and we are number four. So you can see there are four gray lines, one, two, three, four. We're going to be the northernmost one. Uh, are we likely to see an occultation? That depends on, on how wide the red lines are compared to the blue lines. I would say that we are no more than 50% likely to see an occultation because it's, you know, like, like 65% of the time, the center line will be down here and we'll miss it. If it's up here, we'll get it. If it migrates north, we'll catch it. But, um, you know, we've got a pretty, if, but this is, so this is the width of the asteroid here the, between the two blue lines. That's the diameter. And we're inside the diameter if it's on the center line. If it moves north, we can catch it if it's anywhere here. If it moves south, we're going to lose it real quick. So if we did happen to observe it, put some data into this, into this plot. Would that help with the orbital elements of this asteroid? Or it, it might help. It will help with either the orbital elements of the asteroid or the position of the star, or both, oh, okay. depending on the data that they, they extract from it. So the star is right. It's, it's yeah, because exactly yeah, there's some uncertainty in this, t this uh, uh, star's location. There's always some uncertainty. And uh, since, you know, I'm new at this, but as I understand it, since the uh, Hipparchos uh, star location data was taken uh, over 10 years ago, I believe, there has been a, a certain amount of proper motion of these stars in the sky, which is no longer accounted for by the locations measured by Hipparchos and other satellites. And we don't know exactly what direction the star is moving in its proper motion, but you know, just a few arc seconds can be enough to swing the shadow by many kilometers on the surface of the Earth. So we have that to deal with. But you know, we'll go, and uh, obviously the highest probability is is around the center line, in, and and we'll we've got four people. So you know, if we're lucky enough, we might get all four uh, observing a hit or a positive. And if anybody observes a positive then everybody who observes a negative should also report their observation because that means that we know where it was and now we know where it wasn't and that's information that's very valuable if everybody observes a negative we don't i don't think they uh they in, in the past have uh, bothered to send in the you know the observations so uh, this is pretty cool because you can uh, you can choose you know if you're going mobile you can switch to satellite view and say you know where where should I set up and uh, you know you can pick a spot that's uh, you know find a, find a road or an access find a road or, a, or the shore of a lake or a, a park you know if you know the area and you know what all these places are you can uh, you know you can say oh, I'll go out here to the intersection of Cole Road I know that somebody shot out. I know that somebody shot out the light, or whatever, you know. Right. So, it's a very powerful uh, tool. Yeah. 
I've been playing with it, so I've been getting a little familiar with how it operates. It's been very cool. Oh, excellent. Very informative, actually. Yeah, that's quite amazing. So, um, that's the, uh, the map. Now, viewing the details on the web is uh, the next area that I'll look at. Um, basically, this gives you a high-level view of the shadow path across the Earth. You can see that it's basically high overhead when it's over Europe, and we're catching it fairly late, so the shadow will be somewhat elongated in a I'm, northwest... I say late, I well, the shadow is passing across the Earth um, along this white line. And I'm assuming it's going from right to left, although I, I, I don't see an arrow on here. Uh, what I mean by late is that we are close to the point where the shadow would fall off the edge of the Earth and go back out into space. Uh, it's actually the Earth's motion that, const that, that accounts for most of the motion of the shadow. We're, we're, we're actually passing through a fairly stationary shadow cone from the uh, asteroid. Because the asteroids don't move that fast. We move much more quickly than they do. So I was recently, it was recently explained to me that most of the relative motion of the Earth and the shadow circle is the Earth's motion around the Sun. So you can think of us passing underneath this fixed shadow cone. And if, that's, a great, if, that's a great description. I'm glad you said that. Because I'm trying to, trying to, try to put the motions of all of them. Exactly. It's really so, dynamic, isn't it? Yeah. To a first approximation, the, the asteroid is still, the star is still, and we're simply sweeping across this cone of, of shadow, similar to an eclipse, but in an eclipse the moon moves, in this case we're moving. Um, so this, the, the shadow will be closest to a perfect circle, or it will be closest to an accurate outline of the asteroid, if the asteroid is anything other than a circle right at this point when it's straight underneath it. Only slight smearing to the north and the south based on the curvature of the Earth. But by the time you get over here near the limb, the shadow is actually elongated quite a bit um, because of the, uh, the fact that it's hitting very obliquely on the surface at quite a high angle. So it'll be, it'll be fairly low in the sky here, and the shadow cone will be fairly elongated in the north-south direction west southeast and over here it'll be elongated in the northeast southwest direction roughly speaking so the detailed so that's a rough idea of what's going on and if you click on this thing I think you get a larger version of this map yeah here we go and uh, now you can get the basic information on the uh, magnitude of the star the RA and declination of the star the maximum duration of the event, 4.2 seconds, the magnitude drop, which will be over full magnitude, which will be easy to see in, a, in the analysis of the video. Um, and then the moon will be 127 degrees away, eliminated 19%, so not a problem there. Um, the asteroid itself is magnitude 12.6, but it's not important that we see the asteroid. The star is 11.8. That's more likely to be visible in a 12, in, a, in an 8-inch or larger telescope. Uh, but uh, we don't have to. We don't need to see the the asteroid. We just need to know where the star is and what time it'll happen. So that's. Uh, so let's go back. I think, yeah, here we go. So the detailed information. Is, if you click on that, you get this text description of everything okay. and uh, to find the so we have a we have a 56 kilometer diameter asteroid uh, occulting 11.8 magnitude star in Orija uh, and here we are so it starts in Russia Scandinavia goes across Canada and Northeast USA so it appears that we will be the last group of people on earth to see this uh, the, the occultation, because I think these are listed in order. Mm -hmm. um, then, there's all this other information. Then, here is the times when the uh, most likely, it's most likely for this event to occur based on your longitude. So, uh, 
here's our longitude. We're at about minus 70. So we are looking at 230740 uh, UT, from which we have to subtract five hours. Yeah, so this is nice. We can, you know, it's kind of like do this and then go home and have dinner as right. opposed to go out and, and have it at 4 a.m. or something. So it's, it's nice that it's getting dark early and, and so on. Um, and these path limits are the information that was di displayed graphically on the Google map, so I never look at these because I'd rather look at the map. This is the latitude when, uh, you know, at which it will be at, at minus 70 longitude. This is the latitude that it'll be, which is basically near us slightly north of us. So it, this is basically information for everybody on the planet. And then down here finally is the information for the target star. And here's what we would, if we wanted to go directly to the target star and track it with a tracking scope, we would simply do a go to RA and declination and see if we could find the star or the stars around it in here using these coordinates. And uh, I'll show you the maps in a minute. Um, and that's that's the most important stuff on here for uh, for finding it. But then, of course, to find the star itself, Steve creates. Ah, oh, here's somebody. Hello. Hello. Add people. Did I lose everybody? Hmm. I may have lost some folks. Hmm. Let's see here. Uh, so it looks like we have two people. Yeah, there's two of us here. Participants, two viewers and me. Good. Probably you have to have folks dial in again. Somehow we lost. Uh... Ron, can you hear me? Ah, anti conference. There we go. There we go. I'm old, I see. <laughs> Hi, Ron. You can hear me now? I do, yes. And uh, I see, is Jim on? I, he, Jim dialed in. Yep, dialed in. I see that. Yeah. But I don't see him. Um, uh, has, he, has he connected with you on. Oh, uh, there we go. Uh, Add to conference. There's what we're going to do. Hello? Hey, Jim, you there? Looks like it uh, dropped. Yeah. So we'll keep we'll keep answering the phone and keep trying to add him to the conference call when he calls in. So these uh, so let me keep going then on the wide field view at least. This is the one to give you an idea of roughly speaking where the heck in the sky are you going to be looking for this star? And they did say it was in Arija, so sure enough. Here's the asterism. The constellation is apparently including this area here. And um, I print these. Um, I print these depending on the telescope I'm going to use. Sometimes I'll print these in mirror reverse image. Right. Yeah. And this is so these are created using guide guide eight. Uh, you can create your own. I've done that on occasion. Or use these, and I I print them in mirror image, left to right, by telling my printer to flip it when I print it. So I print two copies of this, one normal and one reversed image, because I never know which direction it's going to be in when I get there. Um, 
So then if we zoom in more, we get each each of these square boxes. Uh, let's try adding to the comments here. Hello? Is this Jim? Or Ron? I'm still here. You're still here. Oh, that's bad. Every time we add Jim, he... Ah, here we go. New contact request. Add to contacts. Maybe that was it. Maybe for some reason they wouldn't let him they wouldn't let him dial in until we added him to the contact. So this is good. All right, now he'll call back in. So on the previous screen, you saw on the widest field view there was this rectangle. That represents the next screen we're going to go to. So we'll zoom in a little bit and you'll see beta or I or or whatever you call it, or regionis right there. And there's M37 and then here's the area where our star is going to be. It would be nice if it was one of these bright ones, but it's not. We'll keep zooming in. Here's the five degree view. We still can't see it on the five degree view because, of course, these are uh, nine, ten, and oh, sorry, these are these are seven and eight and nine magnitude stars. See, the twelve mag star that we're looking for is this dot here, very very faint. And we can't see it in there because it's in that little hole in the in the uh, X, in the cross. But we'll keep going down. Eventually, we will see the star. There it is. So now that's the star we're looking for, and it's nice because it's in a pretty rich field. So we should be able to spot the field fairly easily, especially with this yeah. Mag 8 star right there. It should be blazing out. Um, so there's our Mag 12 star, and if we go down one more level to the 32nd view, half a degree. There's our star, nice rich field. We're not going to have any trouble finding any of these stars or this one. We might not see the Mag 12 or the 13s or 14s below, you know, around it. But we certainly ought to be able to line ourselves up. These four nice stars in a row with this one here, this is a Mag 9. They'll they'll jump out nicely, so I don't think we'll have any trouble. Yeah. So that's good. I mean, once in a while, you'll find the star will be something like this guy over here. Oh, yeah. Wait, in an open, open, in an open area. In an right? open area surrounded by mag 16 and 17 yeah. stars that you could never find in a million years. And uh, and that's, you know, now, if that's the case, then you have to do the pre-point thing, which I'll, I'll explain here shortly. So let's see here. Let's see if we can get, we can invite, uh, let's see if we can invite, Jim. All right, so we're calling Jim, seeing if he answers us. Or yet. All right, we'll let that keep ringing. Yep. Okay, so that's the. Um, let's see here. Let's see how do we get? Oh, okay. So we're in a browser, so we want to get back. Want to get back here? Okay. So here's our uh, here's our uh, our event. Um, the uh, star is magnitude. The uh, combined magnitude of the two is 11.4. Star magnitude 11.8, the asteroid 12.6. Um, we've seen the detail on the web. Uh, view station sorts is very interesting because it says, okay, I'm just going to print a list with distance off the center line of the various uh, one sigma, two sigma center line and, and right limit and left limit events that I calculate. Plus, I'm going to stick in there in order the people who have. Um, Committed to be uh, recording, so yeah, it's I thought, I thought it was pretty cool report right there. Yeah, nice little report. It just gives you an idea that that now we know we got two on the left, two on the right. We know who they are, and Steve Connard. I know Steve and Bruce. I don't know Andrew Sheck. and uh, and basically this tells you when the event time is going to be for each of us. That's interesting. Um, why does it? Why is it 2308 for Steve and then back to 2307 
for Bruce across the center line. That's that's strange. Anyway, so that's that. Um, now, as far as the um, the add-ins go, that's where we can use uh, we can open the event in Occult. So this is Occult Watcher. And it's designed mostly to share information. But for doing the calculations, this program called Occult is the one that actually um, does the, the, the calculations, contains all the tables. You notice this looks very familiar. The map that Steve put on his oh, website is this page, just captured. But uh, what we can do here is click on, um, with this event, we would like to create a list of pre-point stars. So, by, by loading up Occult Watcher, do I have that available to me as well? Um, you probably don't, but Occult is a free download. Uh, and when you, after you, you can install it as a separate program. Yeah. But then you can install an add-in for Occult Watcher that gives you this... Um, basically this option of open event in a cult. That won't right. be there unless you install the add-in. All the add-in does is says, okay, uh, that's an interface to pass the information about this particular event that I happen to be selected, the one in blue, to a cult so it knows which event we're going to try to do some more analysis on. I'll go, I'll go, I'll go find out how to do that. Yeah. Because I, I, I did the same, this is, I, did, I added the C2A Right. Planetarium program. That's good for maps. C2A is right. good for maps. But in this case, we could create the list of pre-point stars. Right. So here's our list of pre-point stars. And this, was, this really floored me when I first saw it, but it makes pretty good sense. I'll explain to you what we got here. As, uh, well, actually, let me open this. Let me open up. Um, oh, I, oh, I can't open guide because it's broken. Um, I'll open this back up. You know, as the Earth turns, if your telescope, if you turn off your tracking, your telescope will be carried, will be the, the, the point in the sky where your telescope points will go from west to east across the sky at exactly the speed that the Earth is turning. Yeah. At, this, at whatever declination you yeah. set it at, it will stay exactly on that declination. Everything will just drift by. And everything will drift by, you know, it'll be more or less horizontal, and if you just rotate your OTA, it'll be horizontal pretty much. But what that means is that if some number of hours in advance or minutes in advance, a bright, bright star that would be really hard to miss would happen to uh, drift through your eyepiece, then if you make sure that you're pointing at that star the right number of minutes in advance, then unless the Earth changes its rotational speed, the next speed minute, that's right. The, or speeds up or slows down, which is pretty unlikely, the um, event will occur when the star that's the target star drifts across your field of view, which is really handy for very faint stars. Right, because that way you can set, set it up early and then Put your video on at the right time. Exactly. As long as, you, as, long as, exactly. You, as long as you are believe you're on the right line. Right. So the way this comes up it, by default is it tells you that um, uh, it says uh, this zero 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 is the time offset from the event, but that's only easy to use if your event is happening exactly at midnight, and, and ours is not. The event time for us, we saw this over here in the view details on the web, our event time, well actually a cult watcher gives you your event time. It's for us it's going to be 1807. That's the time at our location. So um, and if we want to get more detailed we can view details on the web, go to the detailed info, find our latitude, our longitude of minus 70 And uh, there we are. So 230740, and then we subtract our 5. So it's 0740. We, they left the seconds off in the previous one. But um, we go back here. Uh, it's actually uh, eight, 
180740 is our is our time. So if we go to occult here, I, uh, no, let me find it here. There it is. Here's our pre-point stars, and we can put in here the event time of 180740 and select this. Now our event time, the first line here represents the star that's being occulted and the time that it's being occulted. And that's the and the declination offset is is doesn't exist because this is the star. So there's no offset. This is actually the star itself. So now what you do is um, you say, okay, um, am I going to go six hours in advance? No, I'm probably not going to set up six hours in advance. Let's let's limit this to just three hours in advance. So we can turn this down here to three hours and say list stars. And then the other thing is when you do that, there's a bug and it goes back to zero zero zero. So you just have to check this and then check it again, and you get back to the uh, eighteen oh seven forty. So. Now we look down here for a star which is bright, like this guy, 4.7. That's a nice bright star. But look at the declination offset. It's 56 arc minutes away. That's probably way out of our field of view. So we'd like one that's like 2 to 5 arc minutes away or less, but also really bright. So here's one here, which is about... 40, let's see, this is 17 or 18 minutes before the event. It's magnitude 6.5, which should be brilliantly bright in a telescope. And it's only 4.2 arc minutes off of the declination of the event. The declination of the star being occulted is 3116, and this is only 3119. So since our field of view is probably going to be like 24 arc minutes vertical and 36 arc minutes horizontal in our in our telescope, this is well. This is you know if we're centered on this star, then our if we're centered on this this 6.5 star, then there's no question that the that the target star will will drift through our field of view. It won't be just above it or just below it. As this as this one. You know, we couldn't be confident with this guy because he's just too far away. Even though he's really bright, 56 arc minutes is just too far to be considering a good candidate. Right. you got to really kind of target your, your stars relative to the field of view you have. Exactly. Well. And so that means you have to go out in advance and hook up your video camera and scan around in some known areas of the sky and calculate with the focal reducer you have and the focal length of your telescope and so on. What's the cal what's the field of view I'm expecting to be able to record? And if you've got 30 or 36 arc minutes vertical and 48 arc minutes horizontal, you get a lot more choice of stars for prepoint than if you get six by 12. And that depends upon your telescope and and its focal length and so on. So I would I'm going to say that we we will probably you know fool around here. With this guy, it's a magnitude 6.5. You know, we can spot it in binoculars easily enough. Certainly in the telescope. There's its RA and declination right here. If if we if we go there, track that star, and then at 1749.26 we turn off the tracking motor on our on our mount and watch the sky start to drift. At 1807.40, this star should be centered in our field of view, and we should be able to watch it blink up. Right. So is that the routine, then? You, 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 instead of letting this, letting this guy drift by, then turn on your track, and you use just the opposite track. You track this, you track the, you can do it this way, track this star, the 6.5, and then turn off your tracking for however many minutes it takes for that to drift. At, drift. Well, yes, yeah, so, and, and to avoid calculating that, that's why we put 180740 in up here. And that tells us, this tells us the wall clock time in Kenny Bunk to turn off the tracking. Right, right at 1749.26, push the button, and then, and then just sit there, you know, with the video running and wait. Well, we probably don't have to record 17 minutes, but we might, uh, you know, 
Now, if the uncertainty in the time of the event, the, the only drawback to this procedure is that, that depending on, you know, if, you're, if your field of view is, is a, you know, is one, is essentially 60 seconds worth of, of uh, viewing for, for the star to drift from one side to the other of your field of view, you, you need to be confident to within, you know, plus or minus 15 seconds or so of when the event will occur. And if the event has some time uncertainty to it, a lot of time uncertainty, then you would want to probably track the star. You'd want to track the target star and forget this pre-point business, because otherwise it, the, the occultation could occur after the target star drifted completely off the chip in the video camera, or before it got there. Um, so I guess. Yeah, when, when I was thinking about it, I almost thought maybe the, the procedure would be to not track up until you get you find the, the closed pre-point star, and then or, 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 or wait till the star is drifting into your field of view, and or find it, and then track um, start tracking your target star. You don't necessarily know where it is. As well. Yep, yeah, you don't you don't have to uh, track the target star. Uh, unless you, you can if you want to, um, but the analysis software has no problem following the target star as it drifts through the video field and calculating its intensity at each point. Um, it's, it doesn't have to be still on the video chip, so it, it works fine if you have it turned off the tracking and watching the star drift across, or you can track and then the star will be will be uh, uh, will be stable uh, still against against the on the video chip, you know, fairly still. So this is this is handy. Uh, the pre-point stars is handy. And then there's another technique in guide where you can actually create pre-point star maps of the sky with a little a little line. But unfortunately, my guide eight doesn't want to start. I wish I knew. Anyway, Guide is a program you can buy from a guy in Maine. And it's a wonderful, wonderful program. Yeah, I don't I don't think I I think I uninstalled it to, to try to reinstall it, it didn't work, so I'll figure something out. Alrighty, so uh, that's that. I'll go back to the Cult Watcher here. So we're all registered. Everybody knows we're going to be on that location relative to the star. And over the next few days, I wouldn't be surprised if more people sign up around the planet sure. for this event. I mean, I don't know how important it is in the bigger sense, but it's got all the right ca you know attributes for us for first as first timers. It's a pretty bright star. It's in an area of the sky that's easy to find. Uh, there are pre-point stars that are handy and easy, and it's early enough in the evening you know, that we won't get discouraged. What I might suggest is that we uh, try to get together once beforehand and actually uh, uh, not only try to find it, but to uh, hook up the video camera uh, that I have, the timing box, the video camera, the, the focal reducer on the scope and get all the, you know, because we, we never know exactly where the uh, proper distance for the camera is to get proper focus. We have to experiment with all that. We might need spacers or uh, extension tubes or we might need to take an, we might need to take an, a diagonal out or in, put a diagonal in in order to get some sort of uh, a proper focus. But, you know, we'll, better to do that before you're on the night when the uh, event is, is coming inexorably closer. Uh, but then again, you have to have time to do that in a clear night sometime before, you know, beforehand. So. 
so you know, we'll have to, because Jim's going to have to be there. You know, he thought we were going to do something tonight, but that wasn't what this was about. But, uh, you know, it's too bad we didn't connect up with him. We kind of pre, pre-scheduled something that we could you know, get together with. Him. I think I'm, uh, I think I'm available. Actually, tomorrow night wouldn't be a bad night for me if the weather is still cooperating. Uh, let's look at the calendar. Uh, yeah, I, I have a 5 p.m. Um, I have a 5 to 6 p.m. meeting uh, in East Kingston, New Hampshire. But after that, I'm free. Uh, and we could, you know, we don't have to do this by any means at the moment in time when this is going to occur it just has to be somewhere up in the sky so let's see where where's Orijah going to be I'll bring up Stellarium um, at uh, 6 well what's it now uh, now it's 8.50 so if we just back up an hour Where's Arija going to be here? There we are. Uh, so it's going to be in the in the northeast, fairly high and uh, time-wise, it's going to be rising. So no problem. You know, basically any time in the evening would be great. And. Uh, this, you know, the star. I can't remember exactly where the where the star was. Uh, here, let's see this details on the web. Let's go to the wide field view. Okay, so let's see. Capella's here, so it's one, two around counterclockwise from Capella. One, two. So it's it's going to be in this part of the sky right here. Right, basically in this area here. And that won't be hard to find. The moon will be right there. <laughs> the hardest part might be finding it with the moon in place. But at least we can, we can, you know. And as far as the uh, the um, pre-point stars, it's possible that that guy right there might be one of our pre-point stars. What are you displaying right now? Because I think it's, it's totally black, which is interesting. Oh, you don't see this now? No. This is. I, I have Stellarium running. Let me uh, let me bring up a window. Is that better? Oh yeah, there we go. Okay, sorry. So here's um, here's Arija here, and and the star is going to be somewhere in uh, in this area of the sky, right about here. Yeah, I checked out where it was last night with the, both both my my own planetarium program and and. Uh, Hello. Hello, it's Jim. Hi, Jim. Hi, Jim. This is Ted and Ron. This is Ron. Hello. I've been watching your screen. I've just had to get Skype working on this headset. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good. Glad you got in. So we're just trying to figure out when it might be a good time to try to open the dome, the roof on the observatory, uh, hook up the video camera, and me- do some measurements of how big the field of view is. Uh, first of all, can we get it to come to focus? And then how big is our field of view left to right? And north to south, so we'll know approximately how much time we'll have drift-wise across the chip in the video camera. Yeah. Uh, are, you think, are, are you saying your your video camera or the one we have, the one that Jim has? Um, I'm, I'm thinking the one I have, which is a okay. which is a, um, an integrating camera yeah. that allows you to specify the integration time from none at all, 60 frames per second, down down to, you know, a second or two per frame. Um, Once you, you know, for a four-second occultation, we probably don't want uh, too slow, but going down to 30 or 15 frames per second does bring out the faint stars a lot better, and we don't lose that much time resolution that way. So we can just click the, I can just turn the knob on the control box for this camera until we pick a, a a reasonably good uh, combination of, uh, of integration time and, and resolution for the star. I mean, okay. it would be nice to find the star. If we can't find the star, we ought to try to find some of the pre-point stars and, you know, kind of be prepared to uh, make all our mistakes before the night of the event. Uh, 
that's all. <laughs> what what is the um, do you normally use a, a, a point five? What what's your focal reducer that you normally use? I, I use a point three three focal reducer. And and that's one that can't be used for visual work, but it can be used for C C D. And the reason for that is the smaller you make the star images, the uh, the more light you have per per pixel on the CCD chip, and as a result, you can detect on the video recording afterwards fainter stars. By uh, you, you you also get more time by increasing the field of view. You get more drift time across the chip, but you also by decreasing the size of the star you you increase the amount of photons that go into each exposure per per cell per well on the chip and that turns out to have very positive effects on the data that you can gather it increases the it improves the signal to noise ratio tremendously by doing that do you know um, do you know what your what your pixel size of your CCD is I can get that information off the web, but I don't have it handy. That would do some calculations. Yeah. Um, I can do that. If you give me the pixel array, then I can do micron, and pixel array and microns, I can, I can get your, I can do math on that. It is a... Whatever you... Go to Watek 120N, that's what it's called. By the way, I got this from Watek for just two hundred and fifty dollars instead of the usual eleven hundred dollars. I was really, I wouldn't have. Wow. I would not have bought it if it were the full price. But they they took pity on me uh, for doing scientific work. That's a half inch CCD, huh? Yeah, half inch CCD. Uh, these are the different uh, levels you can specify. Here's the, oh no, that's the dimensions of the, uh, I'm trying to see if the uh, pixel size is on here. Number of pixels, well you can calculate it this way, it's 768 pixels across a half inch chip. Half inch diagonal. Uh, yeah, that's probably right, half inch diagonal. Yeah. So we'll, we can find that. 768 across a diagonal. Does it give you that doesn't give you the width of the height. Well, you could figure it out. You know, right. That's the hypotenuse. That's the hypotenuse. Oh yeah, maybe a Pythagorean there. Right back to the Pythagorean theorem. Yep, I could work that out. You, go, can, you could look it up. What it is? You could you could <laughs> look it up. <laughs> just Google it. It's easier that way. Just type into the Google search. <laughs> yeah, you know it's fun to type in these long, complicated things into Wolfram Alpha. And oh yeah, I've been using that too. Was that you just sent that out to us? It, it, it does a very nice, like you, you know, you, you can you can type in a question and it'll interpret the question and tell you how it interpreted your question and then show you the formula yeah. it used. Did you send that link out to the club to us? Okay. Sorry. Did, did you send out that link on that on that search that Wolfram? I, yeah, I did. I think so. When we were talking about how many Plutos fit into Betelgeuse and stuff. Exactly. Yeah. That's a very, that's a very, <laughs> yeah, they did a good job. A um, so, Jim, we had the map. Uh, you pro I don't know if you've seen this yet, but this is the map of what things are going to look like. Uh, the shadow will be between these two blue lines here. Mm -hmm. And this, these red lines represent the uncertainty combination of the uncertainty in the position of the asteroid and the uncertainty in the position of the star. So we have a 66% chance of the shadow being in between these two red lines. 
and a 95% chance of it being between these two outer faint red lines. So mm -hmm. you can see there's quite a bit of uncertainty in the probably the location of the star, in which case, so we should not be surprised if we do everything right and still don't see an occultation. Mm -hmm. don't, don't, neither surprised nor disappointed. Because the nice thing is if somebody else gets an occultation hit somewhere else here, our negative becomes very important because it tells where the edge of the asteroid was not. Mm -hmm. So you get good information out of a combination of positive and a negative, and what's even better is is multiple positives and multiple negatives. So like I was saying, Ron, I won't be surprised if other, uh, with four people signed up already and, and the reasonable time period, it's nice early in the evening, I, I won't be surprised at all if we get a bunch more observers signing up in the next couple of days mm -hmm. and uh, filling in some of these outer areas. I think the, most of these are are uh, fixed observatory sites. Now, interestingly, the the uh, McCall of Shepherd Discovery Center is up here in Concord. That would be a nice place to put a, a, a site. But uh, I'll already be here with you guys, and they don't have any video gear or experience in oh. doing this. But they do have a C-14, so they could certainly do this if they were mm. motivated. So. One of my yeah, the one and only the one and only person I still know there is Mel Cameron. Is he? Yep, he's the only there. one left. Yeah. Right. So, so Jim, um, Ted's well, wondering whether tomorrow night might be a, a, a good time for, to do a a, a pre-flight kind of event at the observatory. Um, trying to think, Monday night. I don't see why not. Let's see what tomorrow night's clear sky chart yeah. calls for here. Mine says clear. I'm on clear for tomorrow night. Good skies. Okay. Yeah, good, good, good. Looks looks great all over New Hampshire. Oh. Uh, Maine. Yeah. That's you guys right uh, probably right there. Starfield Observatory, there you are. Wow, there's Bell. Yeah. That looks great. It was cold there tonight. Yes, I'm sure it's going to be cold. Stop by there tonight, Jim. I picked up the computer and stuff. I just want to keep... That'll give me something to do during the day tomorrow. I'll make sure all that the uh, software is all updated and in there. Oh, okay. I have it on my laptops, but I don't, um, the... The uh, club one, I put in a couple of things. I forgot what I put in. I just got them in and running, and then I brought it down. We're not online down there yet, so you can't really do much. Yeah, so, but what we're looking to do is see if we can find this star and check mm -hmm. out the field of view on the, on the camera and the telescope. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And, and figure out what, which, if any, spacer rings or spacer tubes we need to bring the camera to focus. Do we need, right. an, do we need a diagonal, or do we need to not have a diagonal? Uh, we know we need the focal reducer. That'll screw right onto the back of the uh, two-inch visual, the two-inch SCT back, and then hang your stuff off that. Um, the other thing we want to try to do, I was showing Ron this uh, pre-point star business. Uh, Occult gives you the opportunity to uh, to uh, pick stars that are close to the same declination, but earlier in right ascension. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we put in the event time, which is for us, which is uh, seven, what we say it was going to be? 170840. 170840, right. So we put in 170840 here and the stars. So now we get this list, basically starting from the star that's going to be occulted and heading west earlier in time. We've got a list of stars that are that are um, within a certain within uh, 60 arc minutes of the occulted star. The smaller, the better. And we could actually cut that down to like let's say cut that down to 15. So now here's a list of stars that um, will pet if we were on the declination of our target star would pass through our field of view earlier in the evening. 
And okay, so you just set it to the declination you, you're hoping for, and the, these stars should be passing through at those times? Right, and when, yeah. if you, when you see one of those at this time, this is the time you turn off your tracking motor, mm -hmm. and when that star should be dead center in your field of view, you, well, you basically you get that star centered in your field of view with tracking, and then at this mm -hmm. time, if we chose this star, which would give us about seven, well, it would give us about 13 minutes or so, um, when this star, would, at this moment, we'd turn off the tracking motor and just let, mm -hmm. the, let the sky drift by. And at 170840, our target star should be right in the center of our field of view when it gets occulted, mm -hmm. if it will. So if this star is really faint and we can't find it, which, which you know, 11.8 in your telescope is probably going to be a beacon of light. Mm -hmm. But in my C8, that's right at the edge of what I can find. Mm -hmm. So in a C8, I would find a pre-point star and turn off the tracking. In the case of the big, what do you have, a C14 or 16? We have a 16. A 16, a star field. Yeah. We can go to the RA and declination of this star, confirm that we find it from the star maps, and track it right through the event. Mm -hmm. That's There's no problem doing that. Um, and if we can find it, I, I usually like doing that because then I'm absolutely certain I'm pointed at the right star and mm -hmm. confirm it with the star maps and so on. But many of the other people who do this, like Scotty, are, are you know, they're totally confident in their identification of the uh, pre-point stars. And mm -hmm. therefore, they're, they're happy to uh, set up one of those mini observing stations, point it at a pre-point star at a certain time, and then go jump in the car. Mm -hmm. So basically, all these times would be times, uh, candidate times, to set up uh, another observing station. Something. And then if you're you're early enough, then you'll see the other ones go through, and you can confirm that. Right. So you would Let's say you set it up at like where your arrow is right now. All those stars yeah. on top of that will be passing through at those exact times. That way you'd know you're in the right area. That's right. That's right. And if, yeah. if the first few times you would do that. However, if you were totally confident, then you could say, mm -hmm. well, by the time I got to here, I could be 20 kilometers away putting another station up. Yeah. So yeah. then you drive to there, and at 1646 you'd do that, and at 1655 you might do one more, and then, and then you, you know, mm -hmm. there was a night. I guess he did 18 of these in huh. one night, and got them all, got them all recording. Uh, unbelievable. So that's uh, and and then I can't get guide eight working, but there's also a way to create maps of the prepoint stars. With a, mm -hmm. and, and Guide 8 will draw a line through the sky uh, documenting the, the, the path, basically the, a line on the declination of your target star with time stamp, time markers on it going west back in time. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can use that to double and triple and quadruple check that you're on the right target, you're on the right pre-point star, because now you've got the pre-point star and a map of the stars around it. Mm -hmm. so, That's what I was interested in, yeah. So, yeah, if I could get, when I, I'll get Guide 8 working, well, I'll bring my laptop up, which it works, Guide 8 works on the laptop, and we'll, if you, I don't know if you have it already, that, that's fine, but there's an extra piece of software you have to install. Um, I'll bring that along, and we'll have uh, plenty of chances to play with that, and then I can show you mm -hmm. how to create what they call a trail of your star across the sky, and it shows you where where your telescope needs to be pointed at which times to be on the star when the occultation happens. Mm -hmm. Kind of nice. Any, you know, anything that avoids me having to do time-based mathematics in my head, in the dark, yeah, right. under pressure, I'm really happy <laughs> to use because I can't do that. I fall apart. Any questions, guys, or anything else? Well, um, you're coming up tomorrow. So I'll, I'll come up tomorrow if that's okay with okay. both of you. Yeah, I was just wondering what equipment we have, um, if we have enough video stuff to do this also. We don't, I mean, not, maybe not necessarily tomorrow, just to make sure the scope's right, but we I'm could, just wondering what our cameras let's, can do. Let's try as much gear as we can try tomorrow night. Okay. Try your cameras, mm -hmm. my cameras. Um, the, um, I'll bring up my, my uh, score box, my uh, video box, which has the little 7-inch LCD TV in it. Video. That's the same same TV I have. Okay, and I've got a little yeah. video amplifier so we can put the signal in and then split it out to cameras okay. and TVs, as many as we want at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you know, if the scopes are close enough, we can even, even do two scopes, but we'll see. 
Uh, so I'll bring all that stuff up to video camera, the focal reducer for the SCT, the um, you know batteries to run everything, and mm -hmm. and then we'll uh, we'll just see. You know, it should it, it shouldn't be hard to get it uh, focused and aligned, and then basically just find a couple of stars and figure out what our field of view is. That'll be good information to have. Mm -hmm. The focal reducer in there, and then, uh, but because the C16 probably has like a 3300 millimeter focal length or something, I mean, it's pretty long. Right. Yeah. So we're not going to. We have. Uh, I have a focal reducer on the camera right now. I forgot what the what it was. Um, what, the point five one that we had. Usually, yeah. yeah usually they're point five. So we'll switch that out for the 3.3 to get the maximum. But we should do a measurement with your point five because you'll probably be mm -hmm. using that one. Uh, but you can get a 3.3 on AstroMart fairly cheaply. I think I might have paid fifty dollars for this one. And but is that something we? I mean, the one that we have wouldn't help enough. That's been wonderful. What we have already is good. I'm sure it's good enough. It's just that with the 3.3, you get a, com a couple of things. You get more light per pixel, and you get more time in. Uh, in you get a bigger field of view, so you get more time to capture the star as it drifts across. Okay. Yeah, if there's yeah. some little bit of error in the pre-point calculations, the bad thing is when the occultation happens just after the star drifts out of your field of view. Yeah. So the more time you can get, the better, and that's why the 3.3 gives you the maximum possible time, field of view, east to west, and that gives you the most possible time to catch the occultation. Now, what I was wondering when I was looking at charts and stuff like that, I was thinking of looking at... Um, the star photometry or something like that. How are you measuring the the percentage of drop and all that stuff off your camera? That's all done with a program called Li Movie, hmm. and Li Movie, which I can show you a little bit here. I don't think I have a. Oh, actually. I mean, do you feed? Do you just feed that raw video and it figures you, it out? You feed or it an AVI file. Oh, okay. And then it has a little circular cursor that you put over the target star. And you say mm -hmm. go, and it tracks the star across the field of view, and does for each frame it does a, a, a photometry calculation, and then oh, okay. you say show me the graph, and it shows you the graph with the drop in the middle. Uh, and oh, okay. I was wondering how you're getting that. It's all yeah. All you have, all you need is an AVI file, and you're and you're completely uh, automated. You just do a few steps, mm -hmm. and then you can uh, fill out the form to submit the uh, event directly okay. to IOTA from the data that. Does it have any? Does it have any need for certain codecs or anything? Because AVI is just a wrapper. I mean, you could have all kinds of uh, video inside that. There's a lot of discussion of this, and they usually suggest using a uh, something called YUV8. Oh, okay. Or a simple black and white codec that doesn't mm -hmm. require, you know, there's no color required, so you get most information yeah. out of this one. Um, so, I mean, yeah, that that's uh, that's something that I have not checked yet. I, I don't know okay. what my you know what's being used inside the camera or anything, but mm -hmm. the camera records color, and then when you extract it out of the camera with your, you know, movie maker or something to create the AVI file, you uh, you use a certain codec there, and then okay. the YUV8 is the one they want you to use. Mm -hmm. uh, but you you know that's not anything that you're under any time pressure for. All that yeah, yeah, that's an after the fact thing. Can yeah. all be done separately. All you have to do is get mm -hmm. it. So I've got video cameras that, that are, you know, with, with three-hour batteries, which, of course, mm -hmm. don't last three hours at 10 degrees below zero. Right. So we usually stick the camera into a padded bag, uh, a, a padded uh, envelope or two to keep it warm. You know what it works good is um, pizza bags, pizza carriers. There you go, exactly. That's the kind of thing Those work great. You, yeah. you need for that. So there's all these tricks, uh, or a styrofoam, a styrofoam cooler. Yeah, where you mm -hmm. can put the lid on and put your batteries in there and your cameras in there and just feed the wires out through a hole. There's all mm -hmm. kinds of tricks and I don't have I don't have a lot of that gear, but I have the the suitcase. And yeah, we can we can play with it until we. Now, what can you do with an old school video camera? If you had it mounted on a tripod, for example, is there are they any good to do that at all? Or do you really need the? You really need the low light cameras. Okay. Yeah. So you really. But there are quite a few models of those. In fact, some, you know, some of them are like in the forty, fifty, sixty dollar range, and they're mm -hmm. extremely low light. They're black and white only, and uh, they they work great. All we we only we send the output of that into the Canon ZR eighty 
recorder just to get it on digital tape, mm-hmm. not to uh, not to use the actual. We leave the lens cap on the video camera the whole time mm-hmm. and use the AV input to record. Yeah, yeah, that's what I do with my uh, Sony digital. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. You cool. have all the right questions. That's excellent. I had all that stuff with me tonight. When, just before I left, we went to do a Christmas concert with some of my wife's friends. And um, I, I happened to see the email about, oh, observatory, Sunday, Jim needs to run the scope. And I'm going, well, is that tonight or what? I don't have time. So I just threw everything in the car. And, oh, just and, in case. Okay. <laughs> but um, I should be able to record on onto the uh, Sony DV camera. It's just a little camcorder. Excellent. It's actually pretty. It's got a, it's got a digital pickup, but it's pretty lousy. The actual analog one that was out before that was much better in low light. But I use it for, just like you're saying, for looping through and recording and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. Well, the IOTA um, website has a whole manual on this entire process, and mm-hmm. I'm just covering the software side of it tonight, the Occult Watcher and Occult. Um, we'll do some hardware tests tomorrow night, but there's, yeah. there's a whole set of, of recommendations for getting data that's uh, you know appropriately controlled so that they can accept it into the database. Mm-hmm. And, um, sounds like you're already doing well, I've been in video since forever, but um, the software side, I haven't even played with any of this stuff. I opened up a cult watcher and I was poking around and said, what the heck do you do with this thing? Right, you know? yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you know, That's on the kitchen table. You know, if, you had, if I had input or something, I'd sure I'd yeah, pick so up where, on it quicker. Where did my cult watcher window go? Let me try to get this back. Oh, it's probably in here, yeah. So, um, back to... What's funny is before I posted in the email and you told me the 20th, I was poking around at this stuff and I couldn't find anything happening locally. I don't know how I missed it or where I was looking. Or. I think Ron and I figured out that in the configuration uh, prediction feeds, you need to mm-hmm. click on North America low probability events to get this one. Ah, the okay. reason it's low probability is because of that uncertainty being so high. Uh-huh. Anyway, this rank, okay. yeah. this rank calculation, I said I would mention something about that. Rank implies that um, that's the, the percentage chance that if two observers are, are, um, are set across the center line, one, uh, I guess, two-thirds of the way out this way and one two-thirds of the way out this way between the two blue lines, then there's a 59% chance for this event that one of them will get uh, an occultation. Mm-hmm. That's the calculation of rank. And it, yeah. it, you actually can go in the help and get the details. But basically, the, the higher the uncertainty, the wider these pink lines are, the lower the rank. Mm-hmm. A rank of 100 event like this guy here, let me, I have to close this first. A rank 100 event like this one, the Unomia, um, essentially they're saying that there's almost no uncertainty in either the star position or the asteroid uh, position. So now, why is that? Because of the size of the asteroid or because of previous um, sightings or something? A combination or? of everything. That the star yeah. has very little proper motion. We have recent calculations of its, highly accurate calculations of its predictions based on recent observations. The asteroid is big, close to Earth, well known. In other words, mm-hmm. the, the uncertainty has been carved away from every possible place. And the result is that okay. these two pink lines have come in almost to the edges of the asteroid. So there's, you know, this is the 95th percentile is only, it's not even a, an extra 30% out of the diameter mm. of the asteroid. So if you're sitting on the center line here, you have a 100% chance of seeing uh, okay. this thing. So, you know, and, and I don't know if this is of scientific value that people should jump on it. I only see one one person, he's way up and we calculated, we found he was way up in Canada. He's the only guy who uh, has signed up for this yet. Um, mm. Maybe more people will sign up for it. Some of these, you know, at the last minute, you'll get an, an email the day before saying, hey, this is really scientifically important. How come nobody has signed up for it? And oh. Then more people will. But that's through the Yahoo groups rather than through anything else. Mm-hmm. Okay. So yep. that's that's kind of the the story. And what what time is good for... Oh, like I, I said to Ron, I have a... I have a meeting from 5 to 6 tomorrow evening in East Kingston, New Hampshire, and I, 
it'll be about an hour drive up to the observatory from well, after being used to going down there and it not getting dark till 10 o'clock <laughs> i mean anything is early for us now at this time of year yeah it's great <laughs> i agree yeah. what so what works for you guys like uh mm-hmm. 7 30 8 o'clock for me, the later the better, because I'll probably be trying to wrap up stuff. What I want to do during the day, it shouldn't take too long, is to put a remote button box on my camera. Okay, yep. Because all the buttons are on the back, and you can't feel them with your gloves on. If you take your gloves off, your fingers are so cold, you can't feel them anyway. Uh, right. So um, how does 8 p.m. sound? That, that sounds good. It sounds good. Okay, I'll meet yeah. you there at 8, and we'll, uh, we'll see how much we can get done. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, if there's no other questions, the class is dismissed. Okay. Uh, Ed, do you have my cell phone number? I don't think I do. Just in case. Go ahead. Yeah, why don't you give me that right? Yep. 207. Okay. 216. 216. 2475. 2475. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Very good. So 8 o'clock tomorrow night. It's been a great class. It's been terrific. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, there's nothing like watching it live because mm-hmm. reading the book is great, but until you see somebody clicking on stuff and moving the mouse around, you don't get Oh, yeah. It. Well, you, you're you able to vet everything right down, you know, boil it right down to what we really need. You know? Exactly. Right. And that's only because uh, I've been where you are just in the last year, and it's still pretty, you know, the, the parts that were, that were non-intuitive are still pretty clear in my mind. So those are the ones I tried to focus on tonight to help mm-hmm. you over the humps. <laughs> Great. Looking forward to it. Yeah. So yeah. send an email or call tomorrow if there's any anything that goes wrong. Otherwise, I'll see you at 8 o'clock up there. Excellent. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Lynn. Bye, all. Bye.